Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Building Resilient Teams and Departments webinar. I am Amanda Wolford, and I'm joined by Donna Sadoff and Brandon Sullivan, and we're all from Leadership and Talent Development. And while you're listening today, and for a more active learning experience, you can use the action sheet that we provided for you in the reminder email, or you can download it now or at any time by going to z.umn.edu forward slash action sheet. And the formatting works best if you download it in Microsoft Word. So you can use it to follow along and jot down notes during the presentation. And this also becomes your takeaway to help reinforce learning and something that you can reference. So don't worry about filling it out completely during the webinar. You can always do it later. And we'll also point out other opportunities for you to use the action sheet. But you can also look for the icon that's on the slide, too, and that'll prompt you to use it. So today's webinar is part of the supervisory development course, which also contains videos, printable quick guides, scenarios, and quizzes for you to explore and supplement your learning. And to get the most out of the course, you'll want to go to the actual site at supervising.umn.edu and use the tools that are already out there. And of course, make sure that you're applying and practicing the content out in the real world. So last year, we had a webinar on leading teams. And today's webinar is not a repeat of that, but instead some additional content regarding work stress and resilience. If you didn't attend last year's webinar, that's okay. Just make sure to go back and watch the recording, especially because we cover the skills needed for managing team dynamics. More in depth versus today, we're just going to focus on the concepts of work stressors and strategies needed to deal with them. And the overall goal of the supervisory development course and these webinars is to support you in practicing and developing new skills as a supervisor. We're also connecting this content with our leadership competencies to give you a sense of the bigger picture. When it comes to building resilient teams and departments, collaboration is a key leadership challenge to develop, and that includes two competencies, so you can capture these on your action sheet. And those competencies are building relationships and building courageous, or being resilient and courageous, excuse me. And what that means is that you're able to be effectively able to work with groups with different perspectives and competing interests. You're also able to, when faced with conflict, find a productive way forward, able to help others respond to unexpected problems with flexibility and resourcefulness, and being able to express your own opinions and views with confidence. So you'll want to keep these behaviors in mind as Brandon describes stress in the workplace. So take it away, Brandon. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Resilience is a hot topic these days because so many of us are stressed at work. And the trend on this is up. Work stress is on the rise and has been for many, many years. Uh, so are the many physical and mental health problems that are related to excessive work stress. All of this takes a serious toll on productivity and engagement as well, and many studies have estimated the cost of all this stress and related health problems to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars each year to individuals and organizations. There are many sources of stress in the workplace, and we'll discuss several of these throughout this webinar. To illustrate how stress is affecting us in our day-to-day -day work lives, let's start with a common example. For many of us, there is a norm or an expectation that we monitor and respond very quickly to a very enormous amount of information and communication every day. For example, one study found that we check email on average more than 70 times a day. That's seven times an hour in a 10 hour day. Other research has found that about half of us check our email immediately after we wake up in the morning and about as many check email during dinner. Office workers and professionals spend nearly a third of their work week dealing with email, and that's just email. Many of us also send and receive texts, chats, and other types of messages through the day and into the evening even. And more and more productivity apps like Google Docs and Google Slides allow us to leave comments, suggestions, and other information. Now these are helpful for collaboration, but they add to the growing list of devices and applications we need to use to send and receive information throughout the day. One researcher who studies all of this recently summed up the science on how it affects us by saying, digital activity is a boon to us, but it is not without its costs. The cost is stress and disruption of focus. We aren't as productive as we might be. So what does all of this actually look like? 
Well, consider this common situation. It's Wednesday. You just arrived home after a full day of work. You spent 45 minutes battling rush hour traffic, dealing with construction detours. In a few minutes, you need to start making dinner. As you sit down for a moment, you find yourself mindlessly picking up your phone and checking your email. You see that your supervisor just sent you an email five minutes ago with the subject line, quick question. You wonder, is it urgent? Should I read it? Does she expect me to respond right away? What will she think if I don't respond until tomorrow? This kind of thing happens all the time, and expectations for whether you're supposed to read the email and respond right away are often ambiguous. If you wait until tomorrow, will this make a bad impression? Will it reflect poorly on your dedication or work ethic? Because of this ambiguity, many people choose to respond right away. It's the safe thing to do. Of course, when some people do this, it puts pressure on others to do the same thing, and all of a sudden, there's a cultural norm of quickly responding to email during non-work time. Or consider another common situation. You're at work rushing to get something done. You only have a few minutes and badly wish you had more time. At that moment, your phone alerts you that you have a new text message. Your eyes instinctively glance at the screen and see a message from your teenage son. He wants to know if he can go to a friend's house. You quickly reply, okay, and get back to your work, although now you've forgotten what you were thinking about. Just as you remember, the appearance of a new email in your inbox catches your attention. You try not to look, but your eye darts to it anyway, it sees that it's from a colleague and has the subject line, urgent, need your help, in all caps. Your heart rate shoots up as you realize that once again, you forgot what you were thinking about 30 seconds ago. One of the stressors here is that you're trying to meet conflicting demands, but really don't have the time to do it all. How do you prioritize getting your urgent project done, responding to your son's message, and helping out a colleague in need? These expectations and roles are in conflict, and that creates a stressful situation in which you may feel like you end up disappointing everyone. So these are just two examples of ways in which norms and expectations about quickly responding to information and communication allow work to intrude on non-work time, increase the pace of work, and lead to a steady stream of interruptions. As a result, we get stressed out about how to prioritize, how to manage, and how to succeed in meeting all of the demands presented to us throughout the day. So with all of this in mind, we now have a chat question for you. So think about the different roles that you have in your life as an employee, maybe as a supervisor, um, maybe a spouse, maybe a son or daughter, you know, all the different roles that you have in your life, a friend, um, and share an example of a recent stressful situation uh, in which these roles created some stress for you and, and it was maybe difficult to figure out how to prioritize. And talk about what was the example and then how did you prioritize? So you can enter your answer in the chat feature um, and then record your answer on your action sheet. And if we get a few in here, we'll uh, have some discussion now, and then we may also have a little bit of time uh, later on. Uh, but this is this, this sort of role conflict uh, is something that we all are dealing with in different ways. And we don't all have a teenage son. I do. So I, that, that example uh, I deal with all the time. But we all have you know, people in our lives um, that are communicating with us uh, and we're trying to stay in touch with. Go ahead and uh, enter into the chat and on your action sheet some examples of, of how you dealt with that. Don't be shy. <laughs> some of you are probably kind of thinking about it, writing it on your action sheet. Um, and so we'll, we'll give you another uh, couple minutes. Okay. So here we have one uh, pulled from planned work to cover another's absence. That's a great example. Um, that happens all the time uh, here when someone is. Um, out uh, on vacation or something, other people may need to cover. Um, I saw one about um, elderly parents and taking care of elderly parents. That's a really common one too. Sometimes it's not kids you're taking care of, it's, it's parents. Um, yeah, I just see so many examples mm -hmm. where people are trying to really balance um, work responsibilities, kids or other people outside of work, uh, dealing with unexpected, um, kinds of issues. Oh, there, someone said they, they get out and, and go for a walk. That's something that can be helpful a lot of times. Actually, I just saw a research study on this the other day that showed that uh, if you go for a walk over the lunch hour, that can help you manage stress. It may not solve all your problems, but it can help you with that. Yeah, prioritizing health. That's another good one. I saw someone wrote that. These are flying by on my screen here. A lot of you are writing in. Um, but that's something that we'll talk about in a minute too. But taking care of yourself 
needs to be a top priority. If you, you know, if you burn out, you're not going to be any use to the people you're trying to help uh, at work or, or outside of work. So that's, that's something that's really hard to do, but is really important. Trusting team members, yeah, that's a big one. We'll talk a little bit about that, but being able to trust that your colleagues can help you uh, when you're dealing with you know, a difficult problem you need to solve or help you prioritize, um, that's really, really uh, helpful. Can make a difference, actually. Having supportive colleagues can make the difference between burning out and being okay with saying no to something someone said, and that's a big one. Very important. Okay, we, we'll, we'll try to uh, come back to some of these. You guys have some great examples that are coming in. These are all the kinds of things that everyone is dealing with and the reason why resilience is so important. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that a uh, to some of those examples uh, a little bit later in, in the webinar. Uh, but as a supervisor, let's talk for a minute about that. As a supervisor, you are in a unique position to help reduce some of the big sources of work stress. Uh, that doesn't mean you can solve all of this for everybody, but you have a unique um, kind of unique position as a supervisor. In the case of norms for communication, for example, you can reduce the ambiguity by being clear about what you expect. If you expect a quick response to emails you send in the evenings or over the weekends, be sure that everybody knows this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if it's okay with you if people reply the next day, then be clear about that as well. When it's ambiguous, people typically play it safe and assume the worst. Uh, you also have the opportunity as a leader to serve as a role model. And this is really important. Uh, and again, it can be hard to do, uh, but in becoming more resilient and managing burnout or kind of walking the talk, as they say. Uh, so during this webinar, we're going to cover uh, work stress, workplace stress, and some other aspects of that. And Amanda's going to dive into some of that right now. Thank you, Brandon. So these are some of the most common work stressors, and there's four of them. And they are role conflict, role ambiguity, interpersonal conflict, and lack of social support. So in the next few slides, I'm going to describe these work stressors with some examples. And then toward the end of the webinar, that I'll give you some ideas on how to problem solve and address some of these. So first with role conflict, it emerges when multiple roles, just as we were describing, create conflicting demands. And many times we really have full plates at work often with multiple high priority projects to get done. And it can be especially stressful if we are expected to complete all these projects, and then we find out that we don't actually have the bandwidth to do so. Or if we report to more than one person, we may be uncertain when project timelines and priorities can even be negotiated or moved. So facing conflicting demands can lead to succeeding at one part of the job, but might mean failure in another part. And then there's role ambiguity, which occurs when people are unclear or uncertain about their expectations within a certain role in their work or on their team. And role ambiguity can occur when the definition of someone's job is vague and they experience unclear goals, expectations, or responsibilities of how they or others should be performing. And employees who experience role ambiguity tend to perform at lower levels than employees who have a clear understanding of job requirements and what is expected of them. And persistent or ongoing role ambiguity can result in job tension, anxiety, frustration, and burnout, and none of that is a good thing. And then the third common work stressor is interpersonal conflict. So for example, when people with different working styles continue to have disagreements and conflicts that become personal and emotional, that can really undermine resilience, especially if the issues are never addressed. So as a supervisor, you really set the tone. So if you are tolerant of toxic behavior and let it continue, that will set the tone for the rest of the team. And I bet that's something that none of you would want. And the final most common work stressor is a lack of social support. Our well-being has an impact on the people that we work with and on the people who work for us. And the view that employees should leave their personal lives at home might sound sensible, but it's actually very unrealistic. There's a lot of research that suggests a link between social support and connection at work with lower rates of burnout and greater work satisfaction and productivity. But is it really your job as a supervisor to focus on people's resilience? Well, when people feel valued, supported, respected, and secure, it makes each person and the entire team better. And that enables a higher performance and engagement over time. 
doing well at work and encouraging people to feel well is the foundation of a high performing team. A lot of times supervisors err on the side of not addressing issues and wish things would just go away, which of course they never do and only get worse. So instead, being able to recognize and identify work stressors will help you address them and we'll tell you how to do this later. But first, Donna is going to talk about what happens when they're not dealt with. Oh, thanks, Amanda. So Amanda mentioned several workplace stressors that left unaddressed might lead to burning out. So what would that look like? What are some indicators or symptoms you or your team might experience suggesting burnout is at play? Well, burnout comes about when our minds and bodies do their very best to cope with a high level of ongoing work stress. Amanda just gave several examples of that, and here are three of the most common symptoms you might see in someone on the verge of burnout. They are exhaustion, cynicism, and inefficacy. So what do these look like? Well, the first symptom is exhaustion. And this is beyond feeling a bit fatigued or worn out. It's the type of exhaustion where you almost feel completely drained of energy and feel it difficult to function. The next symptom is cynicism, which involves feeling disengaged or completely detached from the work you need to get done. You might hear an individual in this place, in the place of being cynical, saying things like, you know what, I don't even care. I'm done. I'm over it. Why even bother? And then another symptom of burnout are feelings of, an, of inefficacy, which might manifest as feeling helpless and ineffective, having trouble concentrating and showing a significant decrease in productivity. I saw someone on a chat say, this sounds so familiar. So I think uh, many of us can probably relate to some of these things. So the symptoms of burnout that I just mentioned can absolutely impact an employee's performance. And it really can be easy as supervisors to write off people when you start to see these types of behaviors as a quote unquote performance issue. But it might be helpful to reflect on whether this individual is feeling overwhelmed or needs more support. As a supervisor, you can help a team member get to the root cause of what might at first glance be just a decrease in productivity. And one more thing to note, burnout can especially be a tendency for those who are interpersonally sensitive and compassionate toward others particularly if they work with groups with a lot of needs. And this can lead to something called compassion fatigue. And some of you may have heard about this before, but this phenomenon particularly occurs in individuals in healthcare settings or with people who deal with underserved populations. It's an instance where a really great quality like compassion can be overused to the actual detriment of the individual. And as you reflect yourself, you might be susceptible to compassion fatigue if you consistently worked with direct reports, students, clients, patients, et cetera, who are in distress, um, or if you have a high capacity for empathy, or you're in a work environment where work-life balance is not especially valued, or even in a toxic work environment. So we've described burnout, but what is a counterbalance to this really challenging and depleting condition? condition? Well, the answer to that is resilience. And there are any number of definitions of resilience, and you've probably heard a lot of them. But one that we've settled on is resilience is your own capacity to adapt well and help your teams and departments adapt in the face of stress, change, and uncertainty. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. And just a couple more things as we talk about resilience. So I like to think of this image of when flight attendants give instructions for what to do in case of emergency, they always tell you to put your own oxygen mask on first. And likewise, if as a supervisor, you want to help your team members and department be resilient, you have to tend to your own resilience first. And we'll have more to say about this in a bit, but a couple of key things about resilience. It's actually a competency that can be developed over time. It just requires self-awareness, confidence in your strengths, a generally positive mindset, and just practice. The more you engage in behaviors to help you be resilient, the more resilient you'll become. 
So how can you gauge how resilient you are? Well, you'll see in your action sheets a series of 10 questions that can help you determine how resilient you are. We unfortunately don't have enough time to do this right now, but it would be helpful if you could do this short quiz in the not too distant future. This isn't a scientific measure or evaluation, but a rule of thumb based on a series of resilience factors identified by the American Psychological Association. I won't go through each and every question now, but here are a few that will give you an especially good feel for how resilient you are. So, for example, am I able to say no to tasks and projects if they seem too unrealistic to achieve? Do I have the ability to use my skills and strengths in working through stressful situations and have confidence in that ability? Do I have strategies for managing my emotions that come up when I'm stressed? And do I know what triggers those emotions? And then do I have a strong social, social network of supportive relationships with whom I can share difficult emotions and bounce challenging situations off of? And everything we read in here is that last one is especially important. So next we'll talk a little bit about what individual differences are in how resilient we are. So keep in mind that when it comes to resilience, we all have our strengths and vulnerabilities in how we approach stress. Those who are more resilient might appear confident, calm, self-accepting, and stable, but they may not realize when they've taken on too much. Others appearing less resilient might be more self-critical and anxious. However, they are also likely to be more responsive to feedback. We all have different temperaments and the ability to adjust, which leads some of us to handle stress more naturally and easily than others. Regardless of these factors, resilience can be learned and developed in all of us. Likewise, teams and departments can have differences in how resilient they are. I'll just quickly mention hallmarks of what a resilient team or department might look like. And that includes things like they show great persistence in the face of setbacks and adversity. They tend not to overreact to different circumstances, but acknowledge that setbacks do occur and view them as situations to learn and grow from. And resilient teams and departments have the tools and skills to manage their emotions well, even in stressful times. So as we think about the upside of being a highly resilient individual team or department, a question might occur to us, is there such a thing as too much resilience? And the answer to that is yes. Resilience can be overused and is a great example of how great strengths can actually become weaknesses. And this is why we think of it as the quote unquote dark side. In fact, people who are overly resilient may not even realize they're reaching the threshold of taking on too much, risking burnout. So, for example, overly resilient people may focus on goals that are ultimately unattainable, which actually might lead them to give up altogether on goals they've tried so hard to complete. And related to this, overly resilient people take on way more than they can manage which might encourage leaders to assign them even more projects and assignments. And it's the case of giving someone who gets a ton of work done even more work. Unfortunately, the managers of these resilient individuals might not recognize that they could be close to burning out. And I definitely can think of a couple of examples where really talented, resilient people took on, for example, demanding leadership roles or challenging projects without really thinking through what the impact would be on them personally and professionally. At a certain point, some of these individuals who are at risk of burnout come to the realization that they overestimated their abilities and either end up having to find resources to help them get the work done, or they're really overwhelmed or perhaps need to find a, no, a new role. Finally, overresilient people may be prone to accept unhealthy or even toxic work cultures and team environments. Because they're so resilient, they unfortunately may not realize when a toxic workplace is beginning to impact their health and well-being until it's too late. So what can you do to enhance your resilience and minimize burnout while not overdoing this great quality? One thing is to know yourself well and what, and what is or isn't within your control. So one way to build your resilience is to be able to know what's, what is within your control and what's not, and to discern which situations you can influence or impact and which you can't. And once you're able to determine this, you can then respond accordingly. 
So many times we focus a lot of our energy worrying about things we ultimately have no control over or can't influence. And this can be really frustrating and stressful and unfortunately may even lead us to burning out. So as you can see here, it might be helpful to draw a circle and write down these things you can control, which is the innermost circle, what you might have some influence or indirect control over, the middle circle, and finally, those circumstances you have no influence or control over. And when you can depict them in this way, you can begin to see and focus on those things you truly can impact. So a few words about the innermost circle. And these are things that you have the most direct control over, and it includes such things as your behaviors, your actions, how you work, and your responses to adversity and opportunity. And remember, and both Brandon and uh, Amanda mentioned this as well, as a supervisor, you have great opportunities to coach your employees to focus on things they can control directly and indirectly. So speaking of indirect control, the middle circle focuses on those things we can still influence, even if they're not within our direct control. Now, in most situations, there are ways, as I mentioned, we can exercise influence, and it will often involve some level of collaboration with others. We can, of course, influence how others will think or react, but we can nurture good working relationships with our colleagues by building trust, respecting one another, and doing what we can to be helpful to those we work with. We have an opportunity to impact the behavior of our peers, manager, direct reports, clients, and others. In order to build influence, we also need to develop our own self-awareness of our interpersonal strengths in areas that need development. For example, it's helpful to anticipate situations and people that may trigger a stress response in us, which may in turn lead to conflict. By reflecting on our own tendencies and thinking ahead about how the situation might unfold, we can determine the best way to respond to these, to these stressors and potential conflicts. So what about those things over which we feel no sense of control? Well, and unfortunately, there are circumstances over which we don't have a whole lot of control or influence. An example might be if a new leader in a department comes on board who wants to implement a new organizational structure, or if one of your valued employees leaves for a new position and your team has to absorb the workload due to a hiring freeze. Although, although there may not be a lot we can do with situations like this, we can shift our perspectives and determine how we're going to respond to them. As a supervisor, you might help your team think through what is within their control. Ask them to reflect on things like, how might we be creative in terms of how we're doing our work? Is there anything we can do differently? And remember, and you'll hear this a few times, that you do have control over how well you're taking care of yourself. As a supervisor, you can serve as a model for self-care and encourage your team members to do the same. You can really impact whether you have a team culture of well-being and put in place practices to alleviate or hopefully prevent burnout. So on your action sheet, I'd like you to think of a current situation that is causing you some amount of stress. What do you have control and influence over? And what can you let go? So next, we're going to take a couple of minutes to reflect on what you just heard regarding the circle of control um, through a scenario that I'm going to read. And here is the scenario. You have two direct reports. One is still complaining about a policy that has changed years ago, and the other one constantly complains about the new registration system that replaced the one they were using for the last five years. Both employees are not directly involved in policy or registration system decisions. Therefore, they really have no control over the situation. If you were supervising these employees, what might you do to move them within the circle from no control to the influence or control areas? So reflect on how you might help them reframe how they're thinking about this. Go ahead and do the chat. So if someone says, um, what training do they have? Um, can it talk up what are the, the positive things about the new system and the new processes? Those are really good. Is there feedback? Um, have them be part of the solution. Um, let them feel like they can be part of how to um, actually implement it. 
So also someone said, kind of reflect back to them, which is really helpful in terms of listening. I see that you're really frustrated. Um, how is it that we might move forward? So these are all, all really great responses. Are there internal processes that can help um, share their feedback? So it looks like one of the themes, um, and really a very important thing, is um, you know, clearly you have a couple of frustrated employees who are kind of yearning for the good old days when think the policy and the system was different. Um, but to really listen to them, have them feel like they're being heard, and then um, encourage them to talk about how to implement it, how they can impact, and then solicit their feedback. So, um, and that, yes, and as someone else said, uh, help them understand that they have control over how they can respond. So, um, and then someone said, is there a deeper root cause to any of these things? So this is really great. Um, and all of these things, what you guys had mentioned in your chat, which were really excellent responses, um, it, it gets to the point of helping our direct reports reflect on, on what they do have control over instead of kind of allowing the continued focusing on what they can't control or influence. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda, who is going to be talking about coping with work stress. Thank you, Donna. Thanks, everyone, for participating in the chat. There's some really good suggestions there. And there's some other information here that we want to share about coping with work stress. And everyone has at least three options with regards to areas where they do have that control or influence. And those options are problem solving, reframing the problem, or managing its impact. So if you'd like, go ahead and capture these coping strategies on your action sheet now. Problem solving, reframing the problem, and managing the impact. So I'm going to start out first with the problem solving. So as we've said many times today, as a supervisor, you have the ability to lessen many of these stressors for individuals that you supervise, especially through problem solving. So let's remind ourselves of the four work stressors of role conflict and ambiguity, interpersonal conflict, and lack of social support. And now I'm going to give you some, some strategies on how to address those. So you can help turn role conflict into role clarity by clarifying what the priorities are, especially if a direct report is working on multiple projects. And then be sure that everyone on the team knows what is expected of them and each other and what they're doing. So what are the results and how are they expected to work? What are the behaviors that are expected of them? And feel free to ask them, is it clear what you're responsible for or how can I help you? And then with role ambiguity, you can help improve that by providing ongoing feedback and coaching. Make sure that you're meeting with direct reports one-on-one -on, -one on a regular basis to talk about their workload, goals, and their progress toward the goals. Help to set boundaries with clients and other external requests, too, that might be coming in. Role ambiguity can be reduced or avoided in many instances by clearly articulating the expected behaviors and outcomes. So essentially describing what success looks like in a person's role will really help clear that up. And let's just face it, conflict is part of the workplace, but it certainly can undermine resilience. So there's better ways to go about it. Oftentimes what surfaces as interpersonal or relationship conflict really started with a simple disagreement about what needs to be done and how to do it. If personal and emotional disagreements not addressed, it will harm the team's performance and psychological safety. So in other words, the worst thing you can do is ignore it, hope it will go away, or wait until things get really bad. A team environment with low psychological safety drains resilience and increases potential for burnout. And I'm going to talk more about psychological safety in just a moment. But when dealing with interpersonal conflict, you can start by helping others manage their emotions and practice reflective listening. And you can read more about these in the Managing Emotions and Building Trust Quick Guides, which are part of the Managing Conflict module in the Supervisory Development course. And in there, we cover how to practice a delayed response, how to use those non-reactive statements, and reflective listening. A lot more detail are in those quick guides. And then when it comes to conflict within a team, you can also help improve that by making sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of their purpose. 
making sure that their role is clear and how decisions are made. So many times conflicts arise when team members don't understand or they don't agree on their purpose. And other times conflict stems from unclear roles or confusion about how the team is making decisions. So addressing gaps in any of those areas are some of the best ways to reduce conflict in a team. So back to psychological safety. By doing all of these things, it will help your team to foster a sense of psychological safety, which is a shared belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. And by creating this type of environment, by modeling these behaviors yourself will help your team or department to follow your lead. So make sure that you are also asking for feedback regularly, acknowledging and admitting your own mistakes, asking for and welcoming different perspectives, and asking open-ended questions and, re and practicing reflective listening. Again, you can see the Building Trust Quick Guide from the Supervisory Development course. And the final work stressor you can problem solve is a lack of social support. So this is a key source of resilience and providing the social support that individuals need to both manage emotions and solve problems in day-to-day -day work will really help build resilience in people. Greater connection with others within and outside of work can reduce the risk of burnout to a significant degree. Encourage people to share to the extent that they're comfortable, of course, about what's happening in their lives outside of work, and also help team members get to know one another a bit better so that they can improve their interpersonal interactions and engagement. And although as leaders and supervisors, we cannot necessarily impact our employees' life outside of work, but what we can do is some of the following to help build connections at work. So try things like at team meetings, ask what assistance people need and what can one another offer each other. Be open about asking for and giving support and let others know that your relationships with them are a priority to you. And by doing this, you'll be promoting a workplace culture of social support and empathy. And also make sure to model the importance of rest and self-care and encourage people to set those sensible limits on work hours and to use their vacation time. And then finally, celebrate collective success and make note of the impacts that individuals and the team as a whole have made. Sometimes just hearing about something that made a big impact can really help create those connections that you're looking for. In addition to problem solving, another way to cope with work stress is through reframing the problem. So if the stressor cannot be removed and still remains, take a closer look at your mindset and assumptions. So oftentimes what seems like a crisis is not actually a crisis. So do you tend to overreact to minor issues or maybe take things too personally? For example, I bet most everyone listening today is dealing with some type of interruption due to road construction season in Minnesota. So instead of focusing on the fact that we can't control those projects, we cannot control the traffic, maybe we can reframe that problem and instead think that when it's done, will have an even better commute, or those potholes won't exist and the road will be smoother, or maybe a longer commute just means that you'll have time to listen to your favorite podcast. So there are usually ways to reframe the short term and then focus what it is in the long term that will be beneficial. And if you can't change circumstances, you can often change how you view and respond to them by changing your perspective. If you remember the circle of control that Donna was talking about earlier, reframing, a, reframing allows us to see some of the things that we can influence. And then if there's nothing you can do about work stressors, there are still a lot of healthy ways to manage the impact that it's having on you and your direct reports. So individually, it's all about self-care. We've heard things like get more exercise, get enough sleep, eat healthy, but have you ever stopped to think about why? Those are acts of self-care that help us manage the impact that stress can have on our lives. So instead of viewing them as, yeah, I know, it's something that we should all do, make sure that you understand that they are helping you cope with the things that we aren't able to change or influence. And managing impact while at work really comes down to addressing those four work stressors that I described earlier. 
So to, to reiterate what you've learned so far, which has been a lot, we've talked about the fact that work stress and burnout are real and they should be taken seriously. And we can learn to build resilience to work stress by focusing on what we can control or influence versus what we can't. And then through problem solving, reframing, and managing impact, we can cope with work stress and coach others to do the same. So I'm going to turn it back over to Donna. She's going to tie all this together in a final scenario where we'll have you answer a poll and chat question. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate it. So the situation I'm going to describe is based on a real life scenario that I consulted on um, a number of years ago, but I've changed the particulars, identifying features, time frame, et cetera. So it's not attributed to any individual or unit. So you want to listen closely to this scenario because we'll have a poll or two um, for you to determine next steps. And um, as always, you can take notes on your action sheet as well. So here's the scenario. Josh is the supervisor of Gabby, and he started to have some concerns about her performance. Gabby has generally been an excellent employee while she's worked for Josh. No matter the number of projects and work assignments Josh has given Gabby, she's always completed them on time. Lately, however, Gabby has been missing deadlines, is exhausted, has developed a, a cynical attitude about her work and the office in general, and is becoming less and less productive. She recently missed a big deadline and has been calling in sick at least one day per week. Josh recognizes workload has increased significantly over the past two months, but although Gabby is struggling, he and other members of the team are able to keep up. So now we're going to show you a brief poll about what you think is up with Gabby. So if you imagine that you're Josh, what do you think is going to be going on with Gabby? Um, a, it's a performance issue, and you should give Gabby constructive feedback. B, Gabby is not a resilient employee because she can't keep up with other members of her team. C, Gabby is approaching or at the stage of burnout. Or D, Gabby may be overly resilient and reach the threshold of what she could manage. So let's see what you think about the poll. And... Uh, it might feel like there's there's not as much information as you would like there, but just kind of in the bits of bits and pieces that we given that we've given to you, what do you think would be the correct response? So it's a situation where you have some individual differences amongst the team members, and uh, you know it's the the classic of we might want to leap in and address performance. That's often what we want to do as supervisors. Somebody's not being productive. So we want to take a look at, um, are they um, doing what we gave them in terms of expectations? And particularly, the thing to note here in this scenario is it's an employee, and, and maybe one of the clues is that generally she's been an excellent employee. She's been able to keep up. Um, and it's not a been a big not been a big issue before. If there was a pattern of her missing deadlines or not getting things done, then we're talking about something different probably. But we have an instance where all of a sudden within the last couple of months her productivity is declining. Okay, should we close the poll? Okay, close polls. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, by far. Um, uh, we had 47% of you said it was C, Gabby is approaching or at the stage of burnout. Um, and uh, many of you, 29% said Gab Gabby may actually be overly resilient and reach the threshold of what she could manage. Um, we had a few of you also that said it might be a performance issue. And, <clears throat> you know, as I said before, we didn't really give you um, a ton of information. So that's something that you'd really want to take a look at too. But kind of given um, her past performance, it might that might give you some clues um, that you can start with um, to see what's actually going on with Gabby. So let's go to the next slide here, and we're going to give you just a little bit more information and context. So here is the rest of the story. So Josh's department recently hired a new leader, Skyler, who's difficult, demanding, and has had very high standards for her direct reports and department. She recently shared with Josh that she works, quote unquote, 24 seven, and that if she sent Josh or his direct reports an email at 2 a.m., she expected them to return it by 2.30 a.m. Ha ha, nudge, nudge. 
Josh knows that his team members do not view this as a joke. Skylar also believes that her team should just know what they're responsible for and she shouldn't have to spell it out. She also encourages a little competition among staff members because she thinks it makes them more productive. Now, Josh is dealing with team conflict with Gabby, being the first indicator that too much work stress was lingering. Josh is concerned the rest of the team might burn out because Skylar added more new urgent projects to the team's already challenging priorities. So again, we'll do a quick poll. Again, thinking back on what Amanda just said, what work stressors might be present that could lead Josh's team to burn out? Again, A, lack of social support, B, interpersonal conflict, C, role ambiguity, or D, role conflict. Yeah, someone said, where's all of the above? Think that all of them apply. Go ahead and indicate all of them. So it looks like there's um, probably the one with the most responses thus far as interpersonal conflict, role ambiguity, they're about the same. Role conflict is also a big one. Uh, lack of social support is um, another response, but not quite as many as the others. Okay, great. Well, the poll is closed. So um, let, just to kind of um, chat a little bit, and I would love to hear if you want to go ahead and send some chats that we can connect on toward the end of the session here. Um, but let's talk a little bit about a lack of social support. Um, we, we don't know for sure what's going on with Gabby or the team, but we might, um, as a supervisor, might want to take a look at whether we have an environment where there's not a lot of social or, or psychological safety here. Um, and there are times when team members like Gabby, especially if she tends to take on a lot of work, can feel isolated and without support. So that's just a thing to keep in mind and, um, and just to notice. Uh, interpersonal conflict also, we don't know yet, but the potential is absolutely there if you have um, a really demanding leader um, who is expecting, you know, sort of 24 seven working um, and um, you know there's there's potentially conflict there she doesn't mind conflict amongst team members there's the potential for in, interpersonal conflict for sure um, some team members might end up wanting to dominate wanting to be in charge wanting to really show that they're you know that they're really um, you know kind of the top person um, role ambiguity eh, role ambiguity and role conflict um, those two, it seems like, um, could be something potentially that Josh could really impact. Um, I mean, certainly all of them, but just to make sure that team members are, are clear about what their responsibilities are vis-a-vis -vis one another. And many times you'll hear, I don't know if it's many times, sometimes you'll hear supervisors say, well, I shouldn't have to spell everything out. They should just know what people are responsible for and why do I have to give them all the detail? Well, we know from engagement and other data that people really, really need to be clear on expectations and goals um, and what's expected of them. And if it's not there, um, it's going to really impact the, the team and their stress level, frankly, and could add to burnout. And then, of course, role conflict. And uh, Brandon and Amanda both spoke about that. Um, and the piece with that is Skylar has added some new urgent projects to the team where they already have a large number of high priority projects. So that's all I'll say about that. And um, thank you everyone for participating in the polls. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda who will wrap things up. Thank you, Donna. That was some good discussion and good scenario participation. So thank you everyone. So. You have learned a lot today, I am sure. And what we would like you to do is on your action sheet, just think of one thing that you're not doing now that if you did on a regular basis, it would help you be more effective in building resilience for yourself, your team, or your department. So I'll give you just a few seconds to think about that. You can always come back to it later. And there's just some wrap-up information I'm going to quickly run through, and then we will answer a few of your questions. So within the Leading Teams course module four in the supervisory development course, there's also a team dynamic self-assessment available for you to take. And that's going to allow you to explore research supported components of an effective team. And it will help you pinpoint which areas to focus on and which tools might be most helpful as you lead teams. So that's both resilience and leading teams in general. 
In addition to that assessment, we also have quick guides that you can download for your reference in the Leading Teams module. For this webinar, we have a new quick guide called Building Work Stress Resilience and a new video, Recognizing and Managing Burnout. So those are at supervising.umn.edu. And also we have been recording this webinar, so you will receive the webinar recording by the end of the week. You can also access supervisory development via MyU under the Manager Info tab. And under Training, you'll find a link to the supervisory development course. For those of you who have attended our webinars in the past or watched the recordings, we answer the questions on the spot. But for the ones that we don't get to, we have a whole Q&A section. So if we don't get to some of the questions that you asked today in chat or in Q&A, we will be posting those within the course site. So what is next? We want you to think about how you're going to start practicing some of the skills for building resilience that we talked about today. You can jot a few notes on your action sheet. And within the supervisory development course, we also have an online form where you can submit questions at any time. Or you can just drop us a note about how you're doing and learning the content in any areas or other resources that you want to know about. We have some additional resources to highlight for you, including the Center for Spirituality and Healing. They have a lot of resources on mindfulness and classes that can help manage the impacts of stress. A lot of people are not aware that the Employee Assistance Program, or EAP, is available not only for personal concerns, but also work concerns, too. And the Office of Human Resources has a well-being program full of physical, emotional, financial, and social health support resources. And then if you interact with students, the Office for Student Affairs Care Program is available and assists in providing coordinated care support and resources to students. And if you want more development beyond today's webinar, we still have a few spots in the Summer Cohort of Leadership Essentials, which is offered through the College of Continuing and Professional Studies, also known as CCAPS. And there is a fee for the course and a July 13th registration deadline. What's coming up for supervisory development is in the fall, we're going to have a compliance module and an employee engagement webinar. So look for more information for those opportunities. And in our final minutes together, we'll open it up for your questions. So Brandon, have you been seeing anything coming through the chat? Yeah, well, there's been just a ton throughout this webinar. And I, I want to make some comments that tie quite a few of these, I think. Um, and it, it comes from some comments around how do I manage sort of guilt over taking care of myself, essentially, which is something people, particularly in supervisory roles, struggle with a lot, particularly very productive people who care a lot. And, you know, there's no easy answer for this, but some things that can be really helpful is to think about what can you say no to? And when you say no, do you need to manage up? Do you need to make sure that the person isn't going to go, someone mentioned this, to the next level up and sort of get that decision reversed? And so thinking about how can you manage up can be really helpful to prevent that. What can you delegate? Are there things you can delegate to direct reports? Or you know, if you're a department chair, are there other faculty uh, or staff in your department who may be able to do some of the work that needs to get done? Um, are there timelines that can be pushed out because uh, work might be nice to have versus must have or may not be as urgent as uh, some may, may want it to be? Um, you know, the university needs really good department chairs and uh, managers and directors. And so it's really important to take care of yourself so that you you know, can kind of continue to do that that good work and not burn out. And, and my last comment is around modeling self-care, which relates to all of this. That is so important, and it is hard if you have a leader uh, who isn't doing that. Um, but it is so important for everybody that those in leadership roles mon uh, model some of that. Um, that makes it okay to take care of yourself, which ultimately keeps people uh, doing good work longer. So uh, those are kind of my thoughts around that, those comments around sort of the guilt and the self-care. Thank you, Brandon. We probably have time for one other question. Does psychological safety need to come prior to social support in a team? And my answer would be they, they probably will happen more in tandem than one before the other. So as long as you have social support going on in a team, you're also going to be building that psychological safety and vice versa. Do you have any other thoughts, Dan or Brandon, on that? Yeah, I think in practice, I would completely agree. Both are going to be built through people demonstrating that they have each other's backs and that they are trying to help and support one another. 
Good question. So then another one, can you be too supportive how to deal with an employee who always has out of work issues? The team is experiencing compassion fatigue. <laughs> so it's it's good that you're recognizing that that's where you're at with this individual and I would say that being too supportive, you're not responsible for the emotional health of any one person. That is a separate issue. But um, I think as long as you're providing that social support, if it needs to go beyond that, that's where you can start to offer other resources such as EAP to these individuals. Do you have any other thoughts or comments? Brandon, yes. Donna? Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Great. Well, that's all the time that we have. So as I mentioned, we will put any other outstanding Q&A in the Q&A portion of the supervisory development course. So thank you for a very successful webinar and have a wonderful day.